Uh, I now welcome uh, a representative from the Uniting Church in Australia. Thank you for appearing before the committee today. I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as contempt. It is also contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should state the grounds upon which the objection is taken, and the committee will determine whether it will insist on an answer. If the committee determines to insist on an answer, a witness may request that the answer be given in camera. Such a request may also be made at any other time. Uh, questions on notice are due back on the 10th of January. For the Hansard record, could you please state your name and the capacity in which you appear? Uh, Dr Mark Zernzak, Senior Social Justice Advocate, Uniting Church in Australia, Senator Victoria in Tasmania. Great. Thank you very much for being here today. Did you wish to make some opening remarks? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, as would you would have seen from our submission, we're supportive uh, of this bill, largely. Um, we do have some... Uh, we have put forward, obviously, some suggestions around the rules that have already been put out so people can see um, some rules there. Our concerns there are about opening up loopholes, typically with money laundering tax evasion activities, wherever you open up a... If you close a door, people will look to go out the window. So uh, there are dangers there that if, if you create exemptions, <coughs> you will open up opportunities there. We've been a bit surprised at um, some of the level of opposition that has emerged on this. This is not a measure that has been untested elsewhere. We have, as we indicate, and as has analysis already been very thoroughly done in a number of jurisdictions, this is a measure that has already been implemented. Uh, it is easy enough to go and talk to those jurisdictions about issues and how it's worked. Uh, the analysis, as far as we can pick up, is this is a measure that has demonstrated effectiveness at reducing money laundering and tax evasion. Uh, it is next to useless against financing of terrorism uh, because the amounts used in financing terrorism are generally so small that the transaction limit that's being talked about would not have an impact. In terms of the need for it in Australia, I mean, there was the very commendable work done by Michael Andrews, and it is a shame that he is not around to be able to defend the very commendable work that was done by the Black Economy Task Force. Uh, they came back with a finding that the shadow economy in Australia is about 3% 3, 3 of GDP, about $50 billion. So I was a bit shocked this morning when the Small and Family Enterprise Ombudsman sort of stated that there wasn't really any problem with tax avoidance, tax evasion in the small business sector. I'm wondering on what basis they're contesting the findings of the Black Economy Task Force and the very thorough work that was done by that task force under the government. Um, that task force also heard from small businesses that they had trouble with businesses who would outcompete them by offering discounts for cash and basically not putting the money through the books, being able to therefore get a competitive advantage through tax evasion against uh, legitimate competitors, which was part of the reason for calling for this. They also had traders in high value goods report to them that they had trouble turning down cash transactions currently. Uh, and they felt obliged to take cash transactions where they suspected the source of the money had a criminal uh, origin um, in that space. Uh, we do give some examples, and there was one I didn't use, which uh, you know, could, could be raised here in terms of you want to look at uh, cash and how it's used in sort of criminal activities. There was the work by the Fair Work Ombudsman, which investigated Biota, the major chicken processor. They looked at one of their subcontractors, which was a labour hire company, Mushland Proprietary Limited. In October 2013, Beta paid Mushland $255,000. On Mushland's books, it paid out $52,000 in wages to 18 employees. And the Fair Work Ombudsman was left scratching their head as to what happened to the other $203,000 for that one month uh, alone. Uh, they did identify that there had been wage theft of $3,400 to 11 workers in that one month uh, from the money that was actually put through the books. Uh, but unclear as to uh, what happened there. The uh, cash transaction limit doesn't force people to have uh, people making payments to have bank accounts. You will have to get probably a bank check to make a payment. And certainly the Black Economy Task Force was optimistic about new payment platforms coming online, and they indicated the transaction cost of, on a new payment platform is about 40 cents on a $10,000 transaction. So it's not a, a high cost once, hopefully, 
those kind of systems kicked in. They also pointed out the use of cash was reducing over time in Australia down from 70% of transactions in 2007 to 40% of transactions in 2016. And that's still a large number of transactions, but the number of cash transactions over $10,000 among those cash transactions would be very small. And generally, when we went out and talked to our community, the number of transactions people would think of where they've paid $10,000 in cash or where someone they knew had paid $10,000 in cash was very small. We have highlighted in our submission, there probably should be some consideration given to people who, for example, have mental health issues that stop them from accessing the financial system or older people who have trouble with the financial system and, and government finding some way of offering them assistance to comply with this measure. Happy to take questions from this point. Okay, so one of the, one of the issues, um, thank you very much for that. Um, so one of the issues we've had is that, uh, 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 you know, repeated a couple of times today, is that you know, cash is legal tender. Why shouldn't people be able to use it in any way they like? Do you, do you have a position on that? Yeah, look, I mean, we already accept that, uh, you know, we have anti-money laundering laws, which to some degree already require uh, reporting entities, which uh, is largely the financial sector, but also uh, gambling entities to have to monitor people's transactions and report suspicious transaction patterns. And again, we gave, a, we gave an example in uh, our submission where we talk about a convicted drug dealer who was subsequently convicted, who paid for a property um, with uh, 181 $1,000 money orders, but $40,000 in cash as well um, in Queensland. And currently, real estate agents, uh, unlike an earlier witness who made a claim, <laughs> claim that is not backed in legislation, real estate agents, high value cash dealers, so people dealing in gold, jewellery, those kind of things, are not required to report to Austrac on suspicious transaction patterns. And we've certainly spoken to former employees in the real estate uh, area who have alleged to us that the real estate firms they worked for had sections of people that were sent up to China in order to encourage clients in China to invest in properties here in Australia, no questions asked. Uh, sometimes they would suspect the source of the money was not legitimate and they would accept very large cash transactions in order to purchase properties here in Australia. And there is no requirement of the real estate agent to report any suspicious transactions. Um, so the, the, um, our first witness today, the, 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 the Small Business and Financial and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, stated as a first point that, it was th th that this was important to level the playing field in terms of taxpayers, but then went on to list uh, some of the problems they saw with uh, the current bill. You talked about that issue of levelling the part playing field. Could you just talk us through that from your perspective a little more? Sure. So the Black Economy Task Force did make the case. They said they heard from small businesses who appeared before them as witnesses who basically <coughs> told them that they were having trouble with other businesses who would undercut them by taking cash payments, which they wouldn't put through their books, uh, and basically engage in tax evasion to get a competitive advantage. And I know that came up, having had a conversation with Michael Andrews, I, my understanding was that did come up in the cleaning industry, uh, for example. And in their final report, they do talk about examples of where they say small businesses keeping transactions off the books, then end up with a lot of cash that, I mean, if you, if you steal from your workers, wage theft is very common in many small businesses. We run into this in the farming sector. I have people in hospitality area telling me, you know, that this happens regularly, uh, that, that people are underpaid in their wages, there is systematic. And if you cheat workers out of their wages and you have that extra cash, you do not want to put it through the books to pay more to pay more tax. So you've got to keep it off the books. You then have, have large amounts of cash and you need to find a way of getting that back into the economy. And that's, you know, this is money laundering where you've basically engaged in criminal activity. You need to get it back into the system. So you need other people who are willing to take your cash in payments to do that. Now, the advantage that what a cash transaction limit does is it's a disruption mechanism. It's not going to stop people, but it makes them harder. It makes it harder for them to do it and it makes uh, activities easier to detect. Because often, if you have to engage in complex smurfing activities, so if I've got a large amount of cash and I'm having to get lots of other people who are working for me to go and make payments to, to try and avoid detection, it can open up patterns that look suspicious. Um, it also involves a cost to me. There's an extra frictional cost in my money laundering activity to try and get it back into the legitimate economy. So there, there's some of the, you know, the strong reasons why this is, on the evidence that's available, 
is an effective mechanism. And that's the analysis of law enforcement bodies. I mean, Europol did a whole, you know, has put out a whole report why cash is still king as to why cash is still attractive for money laundering activities and why it's a, a very attractive mechanism for money laundering. Um, now, what about, uh, uh, <coughs> I understand um, you were in the room during our last witness, so I'm, I'm happy for you to take this on notice if you want longer to think about it, but the issues raised uh, by, by the uh, Funeral Directors Association as to cash payments for funerals um, with potentially you know, an increasing number of funerals being uh, above that $10,000 mark. Uh, do you have any views on that? Uh, look, that did come up, and it is in our submission, that did come up as one of the areas where um, our ministers had seen people making cash payments of $10,000 um, on that basis. I think it would be interesting to see what the data on that basis is. It would also be interesting to see, given the number of other jurisdictions that are not dissimilar to us, I mean, a whole lot of juris European jurisdictions that have much lower cash transaction thresholds than we do, it's interesting that none of the research literature throws funerals up as a significant issue. So I'm a bit, I'm a bit surprised. I think, you know, there is, I'm hearing the evidence, I think there is some legitimate concern there, but I'm interested as to how other jurisdictions have dealt with it and why it's not coming up in the literature that's had a look at cash transaction limits as a significant issue. Most of the other bodies who have analysed this have basically said for people doing legitimate transactions and legitimate business in the economy, this has been a you know, very marginal impact in terms of cost on them. And, uh, you know, I've been a bit surprised at the claims other witnesses are making about how severe this is. But look, I, I would accept at a time when people are grieving, uh, you don't want to make life harder for them. I com completely accept that. But I think it would be worth the committee looking at what's happened in other jurisdictions as to how they've dealt with that as an issue. Okay. Senator Gallagher. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. So, Dr. Zernak, or Zernak, um, so why will $10,000 work when the current regime doesn't work? Why will $10,000, that arbitrary figure, all of a sudden help? Well, I, basically, I mean, I think I, I actually would make the case, and, and certainly the analysis from Europe was a lower cash transaction limit would probably be more effective. So they, they came back with a, you know, the suggestion that was done by the Centre for European Policy Studies with um, ECORIS, um, E-C-O-R-Y-S, uh, basically they recommended a, a 3,000, 3,000, 4,000 euro cash transaction limit and they said that would probably maximise impact on money laundering and tax evasion, uh, tax avoidance versus the cost and, and um, inconvenience to a degree on legitimate people. As I pointed out, I mean, it's a disruption mechanism. So it's actually making the cost of money laundering higher and it's also making detection easier. If I'm having to try and structure my payments, if I've got very large amounts of cash that I want to, that I've got a criminal source and I want to try and get them back into the legitimate economy, first I've got to find, I've now got the problem, I've got to find people who are willing to potentially break the law and accept that cash above whatever the threshold is set. So there's going to be a lot of people who currently would accept those payments, like you know, the high value dealers that the Black Economy Task Force spoke to, who are going to say, well actually I'm now on the hook for potentially a strict liability offence. So I'm not going to accept your cash payment. I can't, I can't take your cash payment. So you're making it harder for the money launderers to get their money back into the legitimate okay. economy. So if you go to the Hollywood example, a drug dealer walks in with a bag of cash, yeah. buys a Maserati, that's not going to happen. Correct. Yeah. It's, it's, is that prevalent? I mean, how many people are going around with bags of money paying cash? Well, as I said to you, in the real estate sector, my understanding is you've got um, very, you've, you've got significant examples of real estate agents accepting large amounts of cash payments to buy properties, uh, you know, we're talking in the millions in some cases. But um, wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be picked up when it's banked? No. No, I mean, someone's got to put that into a bank. Yeah, but, but like, so the, the, person, uh, the person who's got the proceeds of crime buying the property pays the real estate agent, the real estate agent banks it. There's no reason for the bank to suspect that that payment, you know, when the real estate agent's banking 50 transactions, one of them has proceeds of crime as its source. The bank's got no reason to interrogate that to say, well, why would they think, and why should it be their job to do it when it's really the real estate agent who's going to have the best knowledge as to what the source of that funds were? But one of the, one of the disappointing things for, for me anyway is that the, the level of submission to, the, uh, to this legislation inquiry from the ATO and Treasury is, and Austrac is almost invisible. 
So we can't see what you're alluding to in a submission either published or confidential. So we're hearing these, um, uh, you know, these comments or this evidence that it's, uh, there's a black economy out there and this is going to crush it, but um, there's no statistical information. All right, firstly, available. I'm going to say this is not going to crush the shadow economy. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not under any illusions. This is one measure among the many that were suggested by the Black Economy Task Force. So it is, it is one disruptive measure and to combat the shadow economy, we need a whole range of measures and commendably the government is moving on a number of those things. So for example, you know, uh, my understanding is one third of Australian business numbers are currently registered with um, wrong details. And in some cases they will be fake details and in some cases they've just people have moved on, but the system is so badly administered that um, you can have virtually no confidence that an ABN um, actually you know, you can actually trace the details uh, on that. So, I mean, by and large, like when we do investigations, uh, our private investigator far more relies on the ASIC databases. They still have their problems, but they're far more accurate than the ABN, for example. Um, so there are, there are other parts of the system that, that need fixing in this place. There is thorough analysis that has been done in other jurisdictions, because as I said, this is a measure that's not, not Australia's not the first place that would be looking at this. There is a growing number of jurisdictions that have introduced this. There is lots of analysis by reputable both academic bodies and law enforcement bodies that have looked at this. I mean, for example, the European Union analysis found that by cash transactions being present in some jurisdictions, you actually had a displacement effect. So Germany, for example, has been resistant on having a cash transaction limit. The evidence is that more money laundering activity and organised crime have moved to Germany from jurisdictions that have introduced cash transaction limits because it's easier to do and you've got less chance of being detected. So clearly there appears to be some, some effect from reputable bodies. Uh, and, and, you know, to your point about the agencies here not having made submissions, I mean, they were part of the Black Economy Task Force. So possibly it would be reasonable, and it, obviously they're appearing before you, but it would be reasonable for them to expect that they have done a thorough piece of work under Michael Andrews that came up with the recommendations that came out of that. That was a very thorough piece of work, extensive consultations. That needs to be given weight the amount of work they did, which was very commendable work in this space. Who would police this um, transaction level? Um, well, in terms of it would be around detection, and I mean, obviously, a legitimate business that's keeping all its transactions on its books is, not go is simply not going to take a cash transaction once they know it's illegal to do so. So, I mean, obviously, this legislation needs to be backed up with a proper education program. So across society, people understand that this, this is the new rule. Um, but, you know, any business that's legitimate, it, it's not going to require a lot of policing effort. And that, again, is the analysis that's already been out there, is that the, the level of enforcement resources needed to enforce this is pretty low. Because most people, once they know it's the law, and because they're putting everything through their books, are simply going to comply. Um, OK, so, so if someone inadvertently um, breached the rule, um, wouldn't matter they're done as well as the person who intentionally breached it. But I'm puzzled how you, how would you inadvertently breach a ten how would you accidentally take a ten thousand dollar cash transaction? Well you might make two a four and a seven. You might make it over three months. It might be delegated to your manager. Okay. I mean that still probably suggests the business needs to probably have good good systems in place. Um, around transactions, because I mean, clearly, you know, if you're making a purchase, because it's about a purchase for a, a, a package, a single item, uh, a single payment. So if someone's, if you've issued an invoice for an amount of that particular service or good, um, the fact the person's structuring multiple payments to pay for it, surely is something your accounting system should be accurate enough to know that those payments are coming in. I'm a bit surprised that businesses would not be able to manage their accounts sufficiently to figure out they're getting multiple payments to get an invoice paid. Well, I mean, given the statistical rate of failure for small business, I'm surprised that you're not aware that people don't know how to run small businesses properly. <laughs> and, and the reality is in businesses like transport, you could have a $10,000, $12,000 repair bill at 11 o'clock at night, 3,000 kilometres away from where you are. Now, you probably wouldn't pay that with cash. No. The, the reality is that huge amounts of money are expended over time and sure. you know people do silly things so they now become criminals with 120 penalty points and up to two years jail 
Uh, assuming that the regulator applies the maximum penalty, and obviously what we tend to see is regulators, I mean, they set maximum penalties. Regulators will still use their discretion, I would imagine, in these cases. I'd be a bit surprised if a regulator, when it's very clear it's an inadvertent mistake, is going to apply the maximum penalty. Uh, in fact, I'd probably expect, you know, they would start with a warning or, um, and it would be for repeat offenders who claim they're making, multi, you know, mistakes on a regular basis that suggest at least a degree of recklessness, if not outright intention, that, that you would start to see the actual maximum penalties being approached. So, so can you just define for me the absence in the existing structure and law, which is being fixed by this arbitrary payment level of 10,000? Well, currently there is the fact that you can make large cash payments allows, it, it facilitates, the evidence overwhelmingly is it facilitates money laundering and tax evasion. I mean, that, that well, is- it could, it could, but what if, now to give you a specific example, right? And it's a specific example from someone who's gonna vote on this legislation in this parliament. They went down to buy, well, actually they won't be voting, but the person that they work for will be voting. They went down and they want to buy a jet ski. And they went to, uh, the bank take out $12,000 and the bank said, oh, well, you know, you can have a bank check cost you $12, $12 or it'll take 15 minutes for you to get your cash. Well, I'll wait the 15 minutes. They took the 12,000 bucks and then bought a jet ski. Now that will be illegal after tomorrow, but is, it, is that what we're trying to stop? People going and spending their own money, 12, 15, 20 grand, whatever, on something that they see in a window is that money laundering? That's just using your own money for whatever you like. So, but sure. And on the on the other side of that, as I've pointed out, we have examples of a, a drug dealer being able to pay forty thousand dollars worth of cash into a property. We have suspicion, you know, some pretty strong evidence that yeah. you have foreign money coming in, spending millions of dollars buying properties. No questions asked. I mean, there are other measures you can take in this, and you know, we would certainly encourage the government to move on tranche two of the anti-money laundering laws, which would actually compliant with the Financial Action Task Force requirements, require lawyers, real estate agents, accountants, corporate service providers, and high value dealers to have to report to Austrac on suspicious transactions in the same way that gambling entities and the financial sector currently are required to. That is the international standards. Australia has failed to so far implement those under successive governments. It hasn't, you know, I'm certainly not pointing the finger at any one side of government. And there has been, there was a consultation by the Attorney General's department on that. We have a move on that. That would also help stem money laundering. This is not the only measure you could do, but clearly on the basis of the available evidence, the solidly researched evidence, this has an impact on that. Obviously there are other costs and those need to be um, weighed up, but we would argue on the balance of evidence. The evidence from other jurisdictions is the costs of implementing this have been low and there has been a beneficial impact from doing so. That is, that is the evidence. And if you want to allow the person to go and buy the $12,000 jet ski, well then you're also allowing businesses who take cash in hand, don't put it through the books, engage in tax evasion, to be able to have other suppliers they can pass that cash on to, that continues to be facilitated and people will continue to get away with that. The cost of the economy, as per the Black Economy Task Force, is 3% of GDP, $50 billion a year. Okay. But I mean, if people are lawbreakers, they're not likely to be dissuaded by this limit or any other limit. They're just but gonna go and do it. As, as I pointed out, what it means is the business that otherwise, uh, it's not about the person who's engaged in the criminal activity generating the proceeds of crime. It is other people in the economy who are not doing anything wrong, who currently would be, who simply go, well, that money looks suspicious, but there's no law stopping me from taking it. I'll take it, I'll do the transaction suddenly this becomes illegal to take the cash from the proceeds of crime, so I no longer do it. I put all my money, I don't take the cash, I don't take the cash anymore. I'm making it harder for the, for the criminal to get their money into the legitimate economy and turn that money into a legitimate source of funds. It's a much harder sell than cracking down on drug dealers. Ask some people not to accept the legitimate tem tender of a country in whatever level or volume it is. My point to you is you're actually, you're um, currently allowing people to take proceeds of crime. Well, I'm not, I mean, it's well, government, <laughs> the government, the law is currently, you're asking me what's the value in doing this. Yeah, I'm yeah. pointing out to you the value in doing this is you're making it harder for money launderers to get their money into the system because people who otherwise are not breaking the law are not going to be willing to take their money anymore because currently there is no, you know, you can take proceeds of crime 
Um, unless the person's told you they're proceeds of crime, you can pretty much take proceeds of crime and there's nothing's going to happen to you. I, mean, I, I think that's a very long bow to draw. I mean, if someone pays $500, they could have robbed it from the next door neighbour. I mean, where does that argument, you know, logically end? I mean, is it proceeds of crime only because it's more than $10,000? Yeah, but it's about suspicious transactions as yeah, well. I understand what you're saying. But I mean, I, I, if I go, I, I had this experience recently. So I go to pay a bill with my own money and it was over $20,000. My bank has an arbitrary limit of $20,000. It would take me 24 hours to change that limit to $80,000. I'd have to put in a form and do that. That's, that's not cash. That's money I've got in the bank. So I had to send my wife down to the bank to buy a bank cheque and use my own money. People are getting annoyed at that sort of thing. And when it comes to, you know, a cash transaction of 15000 they say, well, I'm not cheating, I'm not doing anything wrong. And it's legitimate tender. You don't understand that, that feeling that people have? I understand that's the case, but I'm also aware that people feel, for example, that I'm aware there are some in the community who feel that tax evasion is a legitimate thing to do, that basically making a cash transaction to a tradesperson and the tradesperson not putting it through the books and engaging in tax evasion is acceptable. So, um, that, you know, this is... Oh, sorry. No, keep going. This is, um, you know, th there is... The behavioural science studies that actually around dishonesty tend to show that where you allow people, where it becomes obvious to people that you can do something and get away with it, they're more likely to do it. So you can look at the kind of studies that Dan Erily has done, um, you know, the honest truth about dishonesty, where basically, you know, most people have some acceptable level of cheating that they will accept, some acceptable level of dishonesty, and that is influenced by the systems they exist within, you know? So most people probably won't think too much about taking a pen from work, for example. You know, it's the property of the employer, but it's a pen, no one's really gonna mind, but probably they wouldn't go to the petty cash tin and take a dollar out of the petty cash tin, right? So that's the kind of behavioural thing. What this does is resetting the behavioural norms within the society, where you're basically saying, if something looks really suspicious, you shouldn't be taking that, that money. And it's basically setting a threshold to say, well, at $10,000, a lot of people wouldn't be normally looking to do a $10,000 transaction in cash, and there's probably a much higher risk when people are paying transactions in cash that the source comes from an illegitimate source. I'll just check. Uh, Senator Patrick, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Did you wish to ask some questions of yeah. the Uniting Church? Yes, I wouldn't mind, actually. Yep, is go ahead. The, um, doctor, is there a... Um, uh, when, when you're talking about 3%, I didn't hear that evidence, but I understand you, you sort of quantified the, the cost to the economy at 3%. Is that uh, relates to money above $10,000, transactions mm -hmm. above $10,000, or is that all transactions in cash? No, that was, that was the entire cost to the economy of the shadow economy. So that was the loss to the economy of the, the shadow economy based on the Black Economy Task Force work. So that was there. your submission looks at, uh, you know, it looks at a whole range of jurisdictions that, which have a much lower threshold. Yep. Um, how much do you think will be caught out by uh, this particular measure? Look, it's, it's too hard to tell. I mean, and this is the difficulty with this kind of, as I said, it's on the balance. We looked at this on the balance of evidence. And the problem with many of these types of crime types, whether you're talking money laundering or tax evasion, is they're often very difficult to quantify because what you've got is you've either got what the regulatory agent or the law enforcement agency has actually detected, and then they've often got to make an estimate about what's undetected. Like, you, you know, you can't go out to small businesses and say, well, how much money did you keep off the books this year? Would you mind telling us? Uh, they're not, you're not going to get an honest answer on that. So often you're, you're working from estimates. Um, you yeah, know, the but as, you, as you've got an estimate for 3%, uh, you're, what you're suggesting is you don't have an estimate for you know, uh, what the $10,000 um, uh, amount is. So in some sense, this is uh, either there is a st statistic somewhere and we need to discover what it is, or alternatively, people are guessing. Yeah, look, I, I don't think you'll get that. It certainly wasn't in the Black Economy Task Force report. And I think the other analysis I've seen from other jurisdictions is they haven't been able to, to um, solidly quantify the impact. So a lot of it is 
um, best best estimates and um, some evidence. I mean, we have pointed to some of those studies. There's an Italian study. Um, I mean, the one I keep pointing to is this study that was done for the European Union study on European initiative for restrictions on payments in cash, which was the December 2017 study. So there is there is material that the committee um, can look at where there has been thorough studies done on this. But the best you'll get will be some estimates and what, we, what we're arguing, I guess, is on the balance of the evidence that's available, this measure will have a positive impact on money laundering and tax evasion um, and the costs of implementing it are low. Um, there will need to be some thinking, as we've said, there needs to be some thinking about carve outs or some sort of defence for um, vulnerable people in the community, but the evidence, again, from other jurisdictions appears to be that is not significant. Uh, the, the Law Society suggests the agency assigned responsibility for this, uh, for enforcement, is in, indeed uh, the AFP. Now, this goes to Senator Gallagher's comments about, uh, you know, people who are perhaps uh, dealing in drugs. Uh, presuming there are no additional resources thrown at this, I mean, are we now taking AFP resources away from that sort of hardcore law enforcement uh, activity to a you know, to the softer um, uh, you know, sector of unlawful conduct. I actually suspect the way the AFP and it might be worth asking them, but my suspicion would be having talked to law enforcement agencies. Often, what these tools provide them with is they can't make the case that the people engaged in the criminal activity um, have engaged in money laundering but suddenly they can get them on an offence where they've made cash transaction payments that the, are easy to prove were made. So it gives them other tools to go after um, people engaged in organised crime where it's very difficult to prove the organised criminal activity. Um, but the, you know, this, this kind of... That, I mean, that's how I suspect they would use this kind of offence. OK, and uh, just finally, because I um, have to board a plane, but uh, are you... Um uh, not only you're representing the United Church today, uh, what's the status in respect of churches receiving donations uh, and are there any exemptions in relation to this law? Um, if, I, if I'm a, uh, a you know, church goer and I want to donate money to a church, I've got $20,000 and I want to hand you some cash, um, are there any exemptions for churches? I don't... There are no exemptions in the Act for um, churches on donations. As far as I read the legislation, I don't believe there is any exemption there, but I can't think of an example where someone's given us a donation of that level in cash. Um, normally it would, they would do a transfer or we'd get a cheque or I, I can't think of people turning up with a large amount of money and giving it to us in hard cash. I would have to check with our donations people, but that would be my understanding. All right. Thank you. And thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Patrick. And thank you, Mr. Zansak, uh, we will move straight on with the Law Council.